This morning we've got uh, something a little bit different than, than usual. It's a book review. And uh, the plan is to open up scripture and sort of offer a, a biblical critique of, of a book that's, that's impacted our own church and what I hope will be a helpful <clears throat> exercise in discernment. Uh, before we jump in, let me go ahead and pray. God, thank you so much for your word that gives us insight. It is what we need to discern, to have your wisdom to navigate where there is a lack of clarity, where we would not be able to see clearly on our own. And you've spoken such a clear, authoritative, powerful word to make clear what is obscure to us to help us to discern our own hearts and walk in a way that is pleasing to you, that is even a blessing to our own lives, to the church and others around us. God, on the sensitive and often confusing topic of emotions, I pray that you would give us insight, help me to speak clearly as we look at your word so that we might discern well and divide uh, what needs to be divided to separate and and see in different categories what we need to see uh, separated, God. Thank you for the, the blessing of gathering with your people yet again, and I pray that you would use this time in equipping hour, as well as all of the various activities from singing to uh, hearing your word opened uh, multiple times again, all of these things that you would use them, God, to glorify yourself, exalt yourself in your church, in this church, for your own name's sake. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. All of us are familiar with intravenous therapies or IVs. IVs are a way of forcing medication or some other liquid into the body when the body is lacking needed nutrients or hormones or other supplement that's needful for our health. An IV is a quick way of affecting our health because it gets what we need into our bloodstream right away. Since blood touches all the various systems of the body, By injecting a substance into someone's bloodstream, we can produce major changes in very short order. Well, faith is the lifeblood of the Christian life. When truth is injected into the believer's new, redeemed heart, redeemed nature, and truth is humbly received by faith, then that faith, informed now by the truth of God's word, changes the believer from the inside out. This is such a simple plan and so wise of God uh, to order progress in the Christian life in this way. And yet we find that in our day, as has always uh, really been the case, we find that even among God's people, we are constantly exchanging the simplicity of faith with other things. So-called mental health tips, therapy, uh, emotional support animals, EMDR, uh, an overemphasis on nutrition and physical health, uh, and the list goes on and on and on, but some key, some sort of key that will achieve a better you, accomplish a better world. All of these things just take the place of simple faith in the Christian life oftentimes. And at least for now, where we find ourselves situated in church history, emotions, for various reasons, seems to be what people are looking to to be a mechanism to affect change. Uh, What to do with emotions, how to think about them, what does scripture say about them, 
people find either we're not giving enough emphasis to emotions or too much emphasis to emotions, seeking to affect change. Well, the book that I want to review this morning and quote extensively from, help us to think biblically about, actually I think imbibes some of those errors in an unfortunate way. Uh, This book, True Feelings, maybe you've seen it, This is a book by Carolyn Mahaney and Nicole Whitaker, her daughter, True Feelings, God's Gracious and Glorious Purpose for Our Emotions. Uh, The reason I want to just use this opportunity, even as we talk again about sanctification, uh, the believer's pursuit of God-given holiness, and I want to just take this opportunity to talk about emotions and what this book puts forward is a few reasons. Uh, One, because of the emphasis that emotions are getting in our day with regard to sanctification. This is just undeniable. Christians are seeking to grow in Christ likeness, and that's a good thing. But they're thinking that the emotions play a role in their growth that it simply does not biblically. And so I want to address that for our benefit. The other reason uh, to use this book to address this issue is because uh, amidst of what is helpful in this resource, uh, there are some glaring errors that I believe make it probably unwise to recommend this book to others, or at least require a recommendation of the book with several specific cautions. And uh, over the past few years, the book seems to have made its rounds in our church and At times, uh, as I've heard about the book being recommended, it's kind of come without what I believe are some helpful cautions. And so as we think about the holiness that God gives, that the Christian is obligated to pursue, I think that this book, just in our specific context, becomes a helpful occasion to just look at some principles that are being taught about the way emotions, the role that emotions should play in the Christian life, and also to just be a helpful exercise in discerning extra biblical resources. And so I hope that this is helpful to that end. Now, we should make no mistake that there is much at stake in how we think of emotions and the role that they play in the Christian life. Uh, If we discount emotions altogether and give no thought to them, then we end up missing an opportunity to understand what's happening inside of us, as well as as we step into the lives of others, we miss an opportunity if we just don't think about emotions at all and discount them altogether, then we actually miss a unique opportunity to speak wisely into the lives of others as we see them emote. (laughs) Uh, If we elevate our emotions too much into a place that God never intended them to have, then we will invite all kinds of trouble and confusion into our lives and likely forfeit the very holiness that we want to see God work in us. And so clarity, love, and holiness are, are really what's at stake in putting our emotions in their proper place. This book, True Feelings, Uh, does, I believe, have really good goals in mind. Uh, Some of the goals mentioned by the authors are a better understanding of emotions in the Christian life, just giving a a succinct biblical uh, or a systematic theology, rather, of emotions. That's a good goal. They aim to help their readers have a better appreciation for what are God-given emotions, also a noble endeavor. The authors on page 26 encourage, uh, intend the book to be an encouragement, quote, to bring all your emotional questions and troubles to scripture. Praise God. We should be doing that, making scripture the plumb line for everything we think or feel about our emotions. And then finally, a a final aim that they mention 
is a greater eagerness to submit these emotions to God himself. These are uh, excellent aims for authors who are going to write on emotions from God's perspective. So if you've read this book and you've enjoyed it, then I'm sure you've enjoyed it for good reasons. Uh, What they're aiming at is good, and even what the book gets right is very good. The high points in the book are excellent, in fact. Um, If you look at the the notes online or that have been handed out, I'm going to just walk through uh, the quotes, and you've got them all in order on the second to fourth page pages. So all of these quotes are, are in order. Here's what they say on page 49. Emotions are not the final authority on what is true or worthy of value. Rather, the emotions tell us what we think is true, what we value. Our emotions don't necessarily tell us the facts about the situation. Rather, they tell us our interpretations of the facts. Likewise, our emotions don't always tell us what the right values are, but they tell us how much we are concerned about certain things. That's well put. Uh, They don't reveal truth, in other words. They merely comment on what we are holding to be true, on what we believe to be true. And so based on what we believe to be true, our emotions are a response or the uh, overflow of our heart, if you will. And so what you believe is true, your emotions will follow your belief. They say on page 64, if happy emotions aren't always right and unhappy emotions aren't always wrong, then how do we know if we feel godly or not? It's quite simple, really. Godly emotions arise from godly beliefs and values. In other words, godly emotions spring from beliefs and values that correspond to the truths and values of God's word. By the same token, ungodly emotions flow from ungodly beliefs and values. The money question is this. Do we believe what God says is true? And do we value what God says we should value? If so we will have true feelings. Again, well put. This is, uh, I think, the book at its best is that they're just putting forward sound biblical truth, not uh, exalting emotions too high, but giving them their proper place, not altogether insignificant, but as a commentary on the human heart of the one who holds the emotions. And so the person who is emoting is revealing, really, whether or not he agrees with God at the heart level, whether he believes God, whether he places a value on the things that God places a value on. Uh, And another way to to say what I just read succinctly, uh, Todd Murray, one of the TES professors, says it this way, you feel how you feel because you believe what you believe. You feel how you feel because you believe what you believe. That's the idea. Uh, Just one other helpful quote from the book. They say on page 67, when it's true that we can't change, while it's true, while it's true that we can't change our emotions directly, we can change the beliefs and values that fuel our emotions. This is how we obey with our feelings. When we understand that emotions arise from beliefs and values, we can go after our emotions at their source. We can target the beliefs and values that lead to ungodly feelings. We can cultivate beliefs and values that lead to ungodly feelings. Change our beliefs and values, and we change our emotions. That's the book at its best. That's so well put. That's so helpful. If you came across this book, if this just flavored 
everything you thought about the book and, and you appreciated the book when you, when you finished it, then, then this is for good reason. Uh, you're not crazy for enjoying the book that I'm critiquing. Um, sometimes I even wonder at certain points, and there's no way that I could know this outside of the, the authors themselves saying so, but there's, there's such a stark contrast, in my opinion, between those statements and other statements, other ideas that are put forward in the book. I, I just wonder, and this is just a question I have, if the authors are actually writing different portions and have a slightly different conviction on the very things they're writing about, because certain things seem to be in such contradiction to the things that we just read. And I'm going to just work through a, a few of those. Just look, uh, moving forward, this is really going to fill the rest of our time to concerning errors in true feelings. And I've just captured what burdens me and what I think uh, is worthy of caution in the book into two major categories. And you have it there on your outline. The two categories, the two concerning errors are this, that it name, misnames the emotions that's, that's one group of, of error. But I think even more significant than the misnaming of the emotions is the misplacing of the emotions. So it misnames the emotions and it misplaces the emotions. And it does this in a few ways. When the book misplaces the emotions, it misplaces the emotions above other faculties and makes them the leader of other human faculties. I'll explain that in, in just a minute. It places the emotions above other faculties so that they lead. It, pla it misplaces the emotions beside other faculties as an equal. And it misplaces the emotions before other faculties as an end to be pursued, as a target to be aimed at finally. I think that's just, those are all wrong places to put your emotions, and hopefully this is helpful for us, even as we examine our own life. What, how do we think about the emotions? Are we exalting them too much so that they lead us in our decision-making, uh, lead us in our pursuit of, of holiness? Do we put emotions on the same level as other faculties like the mind, the will, uh, the desires? Or do we even make emotions the thing to be pursued as a target, as a bullseye, so that your holiness is running after ultimately feeling a certain way? All of those would be wrong placements of emotions. I think the book does this, as, as we'll, we'll see here soon. But the first error that concerns me is that it just misnames the emotions. Listen at this quote, page 48 Emotions not only tell us about ourselves, but they also tell us about other people and the world around us. Our feelings can help us navigate relationships, make decisions, and even discern problems. For example, let's say we feel unsettled after a conversation with a friend. And upon reflection, we remember making a, co a comment that may have been misunderstood. So we take action to clear the air. That's one example. Or a mother may have a nagging feeling that something's wrong with her child, even before she knows all the facts. So you see the feeling, quote unquote, is coming before the mind, before knowledge before all the facts are known. And the authors write, her emotions in this mother prompt her to question her child, revealing a fear her child was hesitant to share. In both cases, emotions alert the mind, which in turn guides the will. While a woman's intuition is not infallible, it should not be ignored. God created us with emotions that are finely tuned to detect problems and discern wisdom for those we love. Okay, there are multiple errors in, in that thinking, but for this, for this specific point, just note how the equivocation 
is happening in the language. She says that a mother may have a nagging feeling that something is wrong with her child. And throughout the book, they use the term feeling to be synonymous with emotions. Well, in this instance, and and sure, if you're a parent, you've had that, right? Wondering, is something wrong? What's going on with, with my child? Something doesn't seem quite right. They don't seem like their normal self. Is that intuition, even as she calls it, is that quote unquote feeling an emotion? Or is it something more in the vein of, of a thought, <laughs> right? You're judging in that instance, not feeling an emotion necessarily. You're not emoting about something being wrong with your child. You're uh, discerning, thinking, putting the, what you already know about your child normally with what you're seeing in a specific moment and saying these two things don't seem congruent, something must be off. I wonder if everything's okay. Well, that's not the emotions at work. That's the mind at work. And so I think that in using feelings, every time she's, the authors are using feelings to mean emotions, they're actually trying to capture a faculty of the human soul that's not actually emotions but it all gets swept up under, under the category of emotions. Um, that's just not helpful. That doesn't help us to, to think uh, sharply about these categories, whether we're, we're thinking or judging, discerning, desiring, choosing versus emotion. That's, that's unhelpful. They make the same mistake uh, throughout the book. You, just, you can see the page numbers, 48, 61, 131, and the same thing's happening here. They say in, on page 61, the apostle Paul commends the Christians in Rome not only for their acts of obedience, but also for the godly emotions or their godly emotions. When he, Paul says, quote, in, in Romans 6, 17, you have become obedient from the heart. You have become obedient from the heart. Just go to Romans 6, 17 for a second. This is what Paul tells the Roman believers. He is only encouraged by their faith, eager to see them as he heads to Spain, hopeful that they will aid him on their way, on his way. And he says in Romans 6, as he works his way systematically through the gospel that has rescued them by faith alone, transformed them by faith alone, and given them a new relationship to God and to sin in Romans 6. He says in verse 17, but thanks be to God that though you were slaves to sin, you obeyed from the heart that pattern of teaching to which you were given over. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. So their slave master switched slaves of sin, and they became slaves of God. And in doing so, in this miraculous change that has happened, he says, you obeyed from the heart that pattern of teaching to which you were given over. Paul is clearly not talking about their emotional obedience. But it's a comment on their sincerity, the genuineness of their obedience. This was not mere lip service. This was not obedience with the, the mere form of submission to God. But this was from the heart. It was sincere. It was genuine. Here they equate the heart, whenever the heart's mentioned, sort more like an Americanized westernized Valentine's Day idea of the heart, and here just equate it, make it synonymous with emotions. That's unhelpful. And then finally, they say prayer is also a primary way that God changes our emotions. Prayer is sometimes one of the last things we feel like doing, but our lack of feeling is the very reason we need to pray. And so here again, they're, they're going to go on in that very section to say, you need to pray so that you feel better. Um, pray until you feel better. 
But here, just notice that when you don't feel like doing something, that's not necessarily an emotional issue, although emotions are involved. When you don't feel like doing something, what faculty of the soul is that? That's a desire, right? I don't, I don't want to choose that. I don't desire to choose that. And so that's a desire, volition issue. You still have a choice to make, even when you don't desire something. And in doing so, you'll actually reveal what your highest joy is, where you've set your highest joy. But here they just equate the desire with emotions. And again, that doesn't help us to make a a razor sharp distinction where we actually can biblically. So those are just some of the way that they misname the emotions. More concerning for me, actually, than the misnaming of the emotions is the misplacing of emotions in the three ways that I mentioned. And first, they do this by just exalting the emotions above other faculties as a lead to those other human faculties. Page 48, when our emotions and our minds work together as God intended, they serve as a sort of internal system of checks and balances. So the mind and the emotions, they balance each other out. Sometimes they say emotions take the lead, alerting us to a problem or concern and moving us to action. And sometimes our logic, there being the mind, and reason are confirmed by our emotions. Whatever the decision, our goal is to put all the faculties to work in the quest for biblical wisdom. That's just very confusing and, and, and not helpful. <laughs> because here, where they, they want to rightly say you're a whole person, right? You're a whole person. God has made us embodied souls. And so certainly your physical and inner self They go hand in hand so long as you're in the flesh. Uh, When you lack rest physically, then that affects your clarity of thought, right? That affects the functions of your soul. You're more irritable, more given, more prone perhaps to anger. Well, strictly speaking, that's not because you're tired. The fatigue doesn't make you sin, but it does make it more difficult to fight sin because your physical body has an impact, a real impact on your soul. When you damage the brain, that affects the function of the soul that remembers and those kinds of things. So, of course, that because we're embodied souls, those things go together, but the way that they want to tie these things together to make them sort of equal checks and balances, or at times the emotions take the lead, is just an error. They get, they get even more clear in, the, in quote number eight, where they say, feelings of compassion move us toward the sufferer. They move us to open our arms to embrace, to cry tears of sorrow, and to serve in practical ways. Fear hurries us through a deserted parking lot or keeps us back from trying something new. Righteous anger drives us to defend the child who is being bullied. Human beings are not programmed machines that move in response to a line of code. They primarily, their primary purpose is to turn away from ourselves and turn God and toward God and others in love. Meaning the primary purpose of emotions is to turn us away from ourselves and turn us toward God and others in love. They go on to say, still, many of us buy into the misconception that to be moved by emotions is a bad thing. As Christians, we are fond of telling each other, don't be led by your emotions. Maybe you've said that this morning, (laughs) recently. Well, they say this is partially true. We should not be led by our emotions into sin. But emotions are supposed to move us. God gave us emotions to move us toward himself in love and obedience. Emotions are not to be stifled or stamped out, 
but rather they are to propel us to godly, God and godliness. And so we should remind each other, do be led by your emotions back to God. There's more equivocation happening where you're, you're, you're using the same word, but in a different sense. Because when they say in the middle of that second paragraph, emotions uh, don't be led by your emotions into sin, but emotions are supposed to move us. Well, you can be moved without being led by something, right? If I push you, I'm not leading you, but I might be moving you. Uh, If emotions are something of a catalyst that doesn't equate to them leading the way. In this, in this section, and I want to look at a few passages to just unpack the error in this way of thinking. In this section, they cite James 5.13. If anyone is cheerful, let him sing praise. And they cite Psalm 56.3. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. So if anyone's cheerful, let him sing. He does this. He acts. If anyone uh, feels this way when I am afraid, I trust in you. He acts this way. And so they sort of draw a parallel or an implication that, see, emotions are leading the way. When this emotion is experienced, it's supposed to lead us to do these things. That's, That's actually not the case. In these instances, uh, the emotions are not actually leading us back to God and godliness. They're not leading us at all, but the emotions merely provide an occasion, right? If I experience fear or if I experience gladness, cheer, thinking about James 5.13, then they're an occasion to do something godly with the emotions, but they're not determinative or they shouldn't be leading me in the sense that they're out front determining what I do. Uh, They're just not a sufficient criteria criteria to make me do anything. Uh, God even warns Israel about this. When you're glad and in the land, you have full bellies, then you have a choice to make. You can forget the Lord or you can remember him and obey him. The emotions, how they feel in the moment, Uh, being satisfied or glad about subduing their enemies. And if you're thinking about the context of Deuteronomy, they're a mere occasion, but they're not leading the way. Um, Just think about if you're angry in an instance, uh, just for, to think of some random, random example, you know, if I'm angry that my wife won't accept my correction, uh, and in that moment, I'm recognizing in my anger that I have uh, pride and a self-righteous attitude toward my wife, in her not accepting my correction, but at the same time, I call to mind Matthew 7, 5, that more important than getting her to see my point and accept my correction is getting the log out of my own eye. And I'm convinced in that moment that even though I feel angry, what's most important is that I actually receive her correction. And I'm convinced I can't even see clearly what I think I have my finger on in her life because of what Matthew 7, 5 says. My emotions aren't leading me clearly, right? The Christian has that opportunity yesterday. (laughs) So at that moment, I'm at a crossroads. I can decide because I'm more convinced about what Matthew 7, 5 says, I'm going to just let go of trying to convince her that I'm right and she needs to agree with me and just say, I'm going to consider what you're saying. And, we'll, and we'll, we'll talk about this, this later. Let's, let's be reconciled and go meet with the core team. So the mind in, in those instances is still guiding uh, the, the behavior. 
Think about, uh, in, in another instance, the misplacement of the emotions as an equal to the other faculties of the human constitution. This is quote number nine on the notes. They, the authors say, quote, as the two of us have studied emotions over the years, we've been surprised to discover that a lot of commonly accepted truisms about emotions actually have pagan roots instead of biblical foundation. Plato and the Stoics, not scripture, promoted the idea that emotions are unruly, irrational, the enemy of virtue, and the weakest part of us. These philosophers believed that the mind and will are vastly superior and should rule over the emotions. Just pause for a second. They're attributing the ruling of the emotions by the mind and the will, how you think and what you choose, they're saying for that, those faculties to dictate what you do with your emotions is an idea that came from secular pagan philosophy. Let me finish reading. Sadly, they go on, much of today's popular wisdom about emotions is rooted in this ancient tradition. Even some of the wisdom, quote unquote, that gets passed around in Christian circles owes more to Stoic philosophy than biblical theology. This is one of those places where I just wonder, how is that the same author writing as what we read before when they talk about emotions just revealing what we believe and what we desire. Uh, the mind and the will, or the value, excuse me, what you believe and what you value come first, and then the emotions are the response to it. And so you can read backwards from your emotions to discover what you actually believe and value. How is that the same as writing the mind and the will can't rule over, shouldn't rule over the emotions. That's a pagan idea. I don't, I don't see how those two things, the, the, the same writers writing those. But nevertheless, they go on, quote 10, because Christ restores our emotions, they can work the way God always intended in harmony with our other faculties. We must not live only, we must not live only to feel, but we should appreciate and apply our minds and wills in equal measure. And there again, they're just fighting for a, uh, what they call balanced or flat uh, view of all of these human faculties, mind, will, desires, emotions. They're all, neither of them has a priority over the other they all stand in line together because you're a whole person. We, we hear this kind of uh, assumption in our unbelieving culture all the time. You have mental health, you need to be mentally healthy, and then you have physical health, and you have uh, social well-being, right, relationships around you, and you have even environmental health, the, your relationship with your environment. And then fifth, in addition to all of those various areas of health, you have spiritual health. And you just have to like give adequate attention to all of them so that they're all in balance. That's a, a, that's a, that's a false, unbiblical idea because what does scripture say? Proverbs 1-7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Solomon puts all of life in the category of spiritual wisdom, the fear of the Lord. And you just read through Proverbs, and that's what's revealed. Spiritual health, if you want to call it that, who you are before the Lord, your relationship with God actually determines what you do socially. Chapter 1 in Proverbs, the friends you choose, son, is determined by whether or not you fear the Lord. So the, the, the realm of social health is dictated, determined by spiritual health. Um, 
your, your, what you do with your intellectual life or mental health. Proverbs 3, be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. That's a, a, what you do mentally, what you uh, choose to trust in. Not self. I'm going to view myself as inherently foolish. All wisdom rests with the only wise God. And so I'm going to seek all of my instruction and wisdom from him outside of myself. That's actually going to solidify my mental health. <laughs> Uh, do not lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, Proverbs 3, 5. All of that's dictated, what you do with your intellect, by what you believe about God at the spiritual level. Even what you do physically uh, with, with your body. Proverbs 24, eat, enough, eat only enough honey for yourself and no more, unless you have your fill of it and vomit it. So your eating decisions, your eating choices, is a spiritual issue in Solomon's mind, in God's mind. Whether you overindulge, whether you, you prove to be a glutton, that's a spiritual issue. And so the, the unbelieving world will tell us you need to have all of those things in balance and not prioritize one over the other. Here, God will tell us that prioritizing the spiritual life, Proverbs 4.23, with all vigilance, keep watch over what? Your heart. With all watchfulness, watch your heart. The inner you, the, the spiritual life of man. Because from that flow all the springs of life. So their, their attempt to make, to make these things, uh, to make these faculties equal is just not biblical. There's one, uh, well, there's a number of passages you could go to to just prove this besides the ones I just mentioned in Proverbs. But just think from the very beginning, if you go back to Genesis 6, God did not destroy the world and leave eight survivors because they weren't feeling right. Which is not what the scriptures say. What was the reason for God to destroy the world specifically? What, what does he draw attention to in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5? Yahweh saw that the evil of man was great on the earth, and every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. What faculty of man is particularly in view as, a, as an occasion for God to flood the world? It's the intentions or plans that flow from his thoughts. His thought life. That's the problem. What you think. What you think about God. What you think about yourself. What you plan against other human beings. Uh, violence being so prominent on the earth. This man's thoughts. What he's convinced of. What he plans. That was the occasion for God flooding the world. Not ungodly emotions. Certainly, if the thought life is out of order, then there are going to be ungodly emotions. But here, the point is that the mind is leading the way. Go to Joshua chapter 1. This is a really helpful passage to consider the relationship between the emotions and other human faculties. In Joshua 1, at this crucial point in Israel's history, as they're about to take the promised land under Joshua's leadership, we see the priority of the mind and the will over the emotions in God's instructions to Joshua. As he sends Joshua now into the promised land without Moses, verse 2, Moses, my servant, is dead. So then verse 6, look at his commands to Joshua. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people you shall call this people to inherit the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous to be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn aside from it to the right or to the left so that you may be prosperous wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth 
but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way successful and then you will be prosperous. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous for the third time. Do not be in dread or be dismayed for Yahweh your God is with you wherever you go. The mind and the will in this passage, every verse of this passage, are taking precedent over the emotions. The emotions really are mentioned one time, clearly, and the mind and will are in view in every other verse that we just read. Just look at verse 6 again. What's the command? Be strong and courageous. Be something. Be something. The command requires an exercise of the will. The command requires an exercise of the will, and it's always this way. When you have a command, when we have commands from God, the will is being called to submission. So God, in giving this strong command to be strong and courageous, is calling for Joshua to exercise the will, not primarily the emotions. Choose to obey God and be strong and courageous. And then just notice the reason that's given. It's, you must do this, Joshua, because for you shall cause this people to inherit the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. So there's a promise in view. Here's what you're going to do. Therefore, if we were reading it backwards, therefore, be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous because this is true. So again, what this is calling in the mind is Joshua to know something. That's the mind, the thought. He's giving Joshua knowledge. Here's what you're going to do. So he's filling his mind with truth. Therefore, live this way. Be strong and courageous. So here, even the mind is supposed to be the motivation. What you know is supposed to dictate what you choose. That's great. Joshua has not only a strong command, right? If God would have just said, be strong and courageous. You know who I am. I'm the God who rescued you from Egypt. So obey me. You don't need any other motivation than knowing that I'm speaking. That would have been sufficient. But then he says that on top of this, let me just give you an additional reason beyond my character is this strong promise. Here's what you're going to do. It's certain. So act like it. And every promise of God really fits into that paradigm. Because this is true, live like this. Be motivated. Believe this truth. Know this is true. And take it on God's own faithfulness. And if you do that, then that becomes the occasion, the motivation to then go obey God. That's why we have to be well acquainted with the character of God and the promises of God. All of those ought to fuel obedient living. But we still haven't really honed in on the emotions yet. Well, well what about how Josh feels about obeying that? Who cares? That's, it's not that it's not unimportant completely, but when it comes to exercising Joshua's will, God's not trying to motivate him by his feelings. So that's not a priority, it seems, from, for God from this passage. Look at verse 7. Only be strong and very courageous. You know, if there was any doubt in Joshua's mind that, hey, I'll get to that in a second. Nope. Only. Don't get to anything else first. Don't feel... Um, don't choose any, any other course of action. Only this, this is your, your only option. You're obligated to choose strength and courage. For you shall cause this people to, uh, or excuse me, to be careful. Only be strong and very courageous, verse 7. To be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. There again, you have the will in view. You're supposed to be strong and courageous to choose something. Care in obedience. 
Careful obedience is another way to say it. And then again, this is for this purpose. Verse 7. You're not to turn aside to the right or to the left so that, purpose statement, you may be prosperous wherever you go. There's another promise. You're going to be prosperous. If you're going to be prosperous, it's going to come by way to careful obedience. Careful obedience is the way to ensure a prosperous way. He says, verse 8, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you shall make your way successful, and you will be prosperous. So again, he has to choose meditation on the book of the law. That requires an exercise of Joshua's will, not his emotions. Exercise your will. Choose to constantly be murmuring so that your thoughts are fixated on the law because you're hearing yourself say it. You're hearing yourself recite it. The, look, the book of the law won't depart from your mouth, not, not even your mind, which is interesting. We think of meditation as a primarily cerebral activity, and the mind is involved. Uh, the heart's obviously involved, but it's involved because the mouth is fixated on it, <laughs> right? Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You know the mind is on it. You know it's filling the heart because it's filling the mouth. So God says, fill your mouth, and in that way, check the mind is full of God's law. All of that requires, again, an exercise of the will as well as the mind. And then just look at verse 9. Have I not commanded you? Have I not commanded you? Emphasis on the I. Don't forget who's talking to you, Joshua. It's me, Yahweh. Be strong and courageous. And then the emotions. Do not be in dread or be dismayed because Yahweh your God is with you forever or wherever you go. So such a helpful statement because when he says don't be in dread or dismayed, this is capturing a state of intense terror, right? The people in the land are in terror. They're afraid of y'all. So you don't be like them. Don't be afraid. They're afraid of you. Why can Joshua not put on the emotion, even strong emotions, of fear or terror? Look at the reason given at the end of verse 9. Because of something true, something you know, something you can trust, something you must be convinced of and believe by faith. What is it? Yahweh, your God, is with you wherever you go. What's preventing the ungodly emotion? What happens in the mind? What happens in the heart? What happens at the level of Joshua's convictions? That's, that calls faith into view. Joshua, if you believe this, that I am with you, then that's going to dictate what you do with your emotions. So here, the mind <laughs> leads the way and dictates what happens with the emotions. You can write down Romans 12, 2, and Ephesians 4, 20 through 24. Both of those just highlight that it's mind renewal that actually transforms us, conforms us to Christ's likeness. Uh, if emotions had a synonymous place, had an equal ability to lead or rule, over the human constitution, then you would get some verse that talks about being transformed by the emotions, being sanctified through the vehicle of your emotions. You just don't have that passage in your Bible. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. As I'm running out of time here, just uh, next, the next 
uh, section, the misplacement, misplacement of emotions is before the other faculties of the human constitution and sort of as an end, right? It set, the author set up emotions in front of us as something to aim at ultimately. This is just unhelpful. Uh, and, and we actively, the pastors in this church, teach and shepherd you away from this very thing. Uh, practicing your spiritual disciplines for the sake of how you feel or coming to your Bible reading to uh, target your feelings or letting your feelings, how you, you know, was I really stirred up in my Bible reading to feel differently? Do, uh, was I really excited about what I read this morning? And if not, uh, it was a fail. I didn't, I didn't read my Bible rightly because I didn't feel a certain way about it. That's, that's a bad way to read your Bible. You can't trust your emotions in that sense. And so they don't dictate what was the profitability of your, of your Bible reading. Well, the authors actually teach opposite. And what they do in the final chapter of the book is that they go one by one through all of the spiritual disciplines from uh, Bible reading to preaching to prayer to gathering with the body corporately and even singing. And they say all of these things, the purpose of all of doing all of these things is to feel a certain way. I'll just show you these quotes briefly. <clears throat> Scripture was written to implant, renew, and revive godly affections and emotions in our hearts. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we're so used to being told that we should read Scripture regardless of how we feel. And this is true. But the end goal is not to check another box off our Bible reading plans. Instead, as we come to God's word, feeling an emotional flatline, we can expect his word to spark fresh feelings in our hearts. So, as the saying goes, let us take up and read to feel. We should not only read to feel, we should read until we feel. And they're not, they actually give a caveat you know, don't call in from work until you feel, but keep reading until you feel better, uh, until you feel right, is what they would say. They go on, Jesus told us to pray in order to feel. Quoting John 16, 24, ask and you will receive that, you, that your joy may be full. Through prayer, we have access to the one person who can change our emotions, and when we ask, he does just that. Prayer changes our emotions, and so we should pray to feel. One of the main reasons we should go to church each Sunday for worship, preaching, and fellowship is to refresh and revive Christ-like emotions in our lives and let us consider how to stir up one another, quoting Hebrews 10, 24, and 25. Stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together is the, is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So they say, on, commenting on that verse, we go to church to stir up one another, in one another godly emotions such as love which move us to godly actions good works that's not even what the verse says it doesn't say love moves you stir up to love so that you're moved to good works it says stir up one another to love and good works so you're being stirred up to both and you actually minimize the impact of the passage if you make love how you feel that's not what's in view it's actually to say love and good works is another way of, of saying doing what's best for each other, doing what's right uh, among the, the corporate gathered body. And then what the outflow of us gathering on Sunday is supposed to be further charitable deeds. They do the same thing with corporate uh, gathering uh, in, in the music that we sing. God created music for this purpose, to stir up our emotions for God and express our affections to God. This is why we worship. It's just said, stated too strongly. Many of us think of preaching as the cerebral portion of the meeting, but the true intent of preaching is to also stir up our emotions for God. Um, if what you mean by that is that you hear the truth and your soul responds in excitement and joy, 
then I can get on board. But to say the purpose of preaching is, is to stir up your emotions is just said too strongly. And then finally, fellowship with other Christians on Sunday and throughout the week is a main and vital source of emotional sustenance. Again, making the emotions play, I think, too primary a role. I hope this is helpful for us to just consider, and maybe even as we've critiqued the book, um, you know, to, if you were helped, again, you're not crazy for being helped by the book, uh, but should you recommend it, that should come with several strong cautions and, and just worth considering, is this worth recommending uh, this particular resource with the, the serious errors that are mentioned here? Uh, this, the, the answer ultimately to our emotions is God's truth affecting our hearts. And as we believe those things, the feelings are, are intended to follow uh, what we believe. And so again, as we've talked about, uh, as I mentioned, you can go back in this series on sanctification that faith plays a, a primary role in the Christian life. And so as you fixate on Christ, you set your sights on him to believe him and from that faith submit to him, then you can trust God to uh, guide and direct godly emotions in your life. So fixate on Christ, fixate on believing him, and the rest will follow. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for uh, the gift of the truth and even the way you've so created us that we do respond uh, in excitement and in joy and gladness, even in sorrow when it's appropriate to what we know is true. And I pray that you would further deepen our convictions about what's true and help us to grow in the knowledge of Christ Jesus so that as we have an exalted view of him, then everything else will rise to that same uh, degree as our exaltation of you rises, our knowledge rises, our desires to please you rise, our satisfaction in knowing you increases, and yes, even to our joy over who you are, who you revealed yourself to be, and the life that we now have in Christ also increases as well. We pray all these things in the name of Christ. Amen.